On the heels of the unrest in the Northeast, the Minister of Defence, Mansur Dan Ali, today said fresh intelligence had exposed the complicity of some high placed traditional rulers in the ongoing killings of Nigerians across the northern part of the country. What does this mean? And how does this statement address the ongoing crisis? Well, to make sense of all of it, I'm being joined in the studio by a security expert, Peter Igbidion. It's good to have you in the studio. Thank you. I mean, I don't think I have to tell you a story or try to you know tell you what has happened you obviously live in this space and you understand what we have been experiencing all through the weekend into today and of course at 7 p.m last night we had a fresh attack yes, in um, but, but but let's start with the minister of defense and his statement he did say that um the fresh intelligence that they have gotten has exposed the complicity of highly placed traditional rulers in the ongoing killings he also said that these attacks blamed on bandits have increased in the northwest states uh, of Zamfara, Sakoto, Katsina, with hundreds of killings in recent months. So this statement, does it mean that he's blaming certain persons in these communities for empowering these conflicts or these bandits? Because I'm a bit uh, confused. He, I mean, he leaves, us, he leaves us with no choice but to arrive at the conclusion that He's been, um, he's just shifting blame. And this is one of the things that this administration has done very well. They've been adept at trading blame, at passing the buck. There is no reason why, if intelligence has emerged that traditional rulers are behind these killings, that they should not have been arrested by now. One of the, one of the, one of the things that is required of people who are in the leadership of a security architecture is that they be swift, they be proactive. If you're coming out to tell the people that, oh, um, it is suspected that some highly placed persons are, that nobody's above the law, there should be no sacred cows. Whoever it is should be able to be brought to, to book quickly. Lives are being lost every day, and, and, and needlessly too. So I believe um, it's just an attempt to pass the buck and it's not going to fly. We're, 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 we're past Again, that talking about Mansur Danali, uh, during the um, herdsmen clash, uh, sometime in, I think we started the new year last year yes. with deaths across River State and uh, Plateau State. And Benue as well. And, and Benue. And, and he did make a similar statement of sorts, saying that, you know, it's not necessarily. Um, the issue of herders, that it was the state who had these no grazing laws that, you know, made the unrest continue. And for me, I wondered, for a security expert or for a minister of defense, should you not necessarily be more careful with the words uh, that you speak, especially when you know issues such as that are a bit dicey or e fragile? Exactly. And, and uh, sadly, sadly, one of the hallmarks of this administration, um, which has um, earned itself another four, or gotten another four-year term, um, is that they have displayed this sort of non-challenge for 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 protocol security protocol there are things that should not be said by people who are in leadership in security and they have repeatedly flouted the flouted the codes of protocols and they have worsened the scenario i mean so if 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 he's saying for instance that traditional rulers are behind what's going on now um, then what what about the what about the 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 grazing routes and the the the, the, the killings attributed to fulani headsmen or mm -hmm. to headsmen and this is they're not separate from what's going on last year they were over there were over, there were at least 1,700 killings of, of human beings in, in Nigeria. Whether it's in northern Nigeria or in southern Nigeria or not, the fact is that every life is important. Every, every life lost is, is, is painful, is, is, is a waste. Yeah. And the government should be, should be brought, brought to book. It's sad that they keep passing the book. We had the president um, on a foreign trip recently um, tell the leaders gathered around the world that um, the things that we know are happening in Nigeria are not happening, and it's not it's not right for us to see this happen over and over again. What what it does is that it 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 makes citizens resort to self protection, and when citizens try, try to do that, you create a state of anarchy. I did ask a question yesterday, and I'm going to ask that question again today. It seemed more like if Nigerians don't mm. scream, depending on what happens, people are dying every day. Yes, I'm sure that if we, you know turn our pens, this is the map of Nigeria, and we turn our pens, wherever the pen points, there's, there's some form of violence. But it's, it, it seems like it's the people who cry out the most, the people who get into the news the most, that government decides or feels the need to address their issues. If the Zamfara people did not hit Twitter, 
if they did not hit the streets of Abuja and the streets of Zamfara. We probably wouldn't have heard about this issue. We know that these things have been happening, but it has come up, the uproar has become louder because maybe a sudden somebody had decided that I'm going to take it upon myself. I, I, I believe um, one of the things that has happened over, over the last four years is that people are afraid to voice out the truth for, for fear of reprisals or, or retribution either from the government or from government-related um, entities. So people are afraid to come out to say what's happening. One of the beauties of social media is that it allows people to be able to break news by themselves. And we've seen that that's what's happening now. So for, for instance, with Kadari Ahmed that we saw um, on the streets protesting the insecurity in her state, we saw that the news circulated a lot faster via the internet, by social media. Um, again, we believe, and we've seen in times past where there have been attempts to to subdue the free flow of information of a security nature across board. So we know that when things like this happen, what happens is that there is, there is an unwritten code, a gag order, like we have to clear with the security apparatus first. And if they don't give us the go ahead, we can't really let out certain information so they don't pick us up and we don't have to start giving account for certain things. And across, outside of this country, this government, this administration is viewed as a, as a dictatorship. To be honest, um, you have people- It's your opinion. No, a, lot it, it's, it, 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 it's a lot of people believe that. I mean, if you look at attacks on the judiciary, for instance, so there is, there is, there is little confidence of, of the citizens and indeed for foreigners in the system because the judiciary that should be, for instance, uh, a bastion of hope for the people, it has been perceived to be under attack by this administration, in the executive especially. So with that happening, you have a cross board, you have the view, the, the, the prominent view held across board is that this government isn't doing as much as it should do concerning security. Um, it's sad that this has happened and lives are being lost even as we speak in Plateau, in Benue, in Taraba, in Kaduna. It's sad. And I mean, if, if, if you take into consideration the fact that Nigeria is sitting on a keg of, of gunpowder, I know the vice president was in Rwanda over the weekend to commemorate the anniversary of the genocide, but we should look inwards. We're, we're literally losing people faster than they did in that time, and we we're not doing it about it. Let, let, let's look at the fact that um, Mr. Danali again went on to say that Locals, especially in Sokoto, Katsina, Zamfara, and other parts of northern Nigeria, ravaged by the faceless gunmen, should rise in unison to support all government efforts aimed at addressing this, this crisis, especially because soldiers and other elements in the armed forces cannot combat it alone. Now, what are they rising in unison to support? Because from what we have gathered, nothing... There's no clear communication of government Nothing has direction. really been done, exactly. And again, I, I spoke with someone yesterday, and he spoke about the fact that these people are growing in lips and bounds. And because of our shortage in policing, the, they're, becoming, they're beginning to overwhelm the security men who are in that state. True. So True. if this issue was dealt with in the beginning, probably wouldn't be here. So again, I'm wondering. What are they going to be uniting with? Behind. Because there is no information. Who are they going to ban behind? It, Who are they fighting? Do they know what they? I mean, what's government strategy has it been placed? You know, it's it's on a the contradiction table? that is apparent to even the layman on the streets. For instance, these communities have their own um, policing methods for security. Their own, if you call it, was as were guardsmen. They have their own uh, vigilantes, and we've seen that over time and again in the last four years that vigilantes and those sort of of, of self-help groups have been frowned upon. They've been, they've been restrained. And when that happens, you, as, you don't expect the people to be confident. So even when the government is coming out to say that, for instance, the, the, it is suspected that the traditional rulers who are behind or, or, or aiding and abetting some of the violence that's going on, it, it's, it's been clever by half. Because if you look at it, if the communities are not allowed to police or, or, or provide some form of protection for themselves, and now you're coming out to say that, oh, we don't even have enough men on the ground, enough boots on the ground to protect you people, then we're literally saying there is, it, it's, it's a call for self-protection, it's a call to arms, to your, to your tents, oh, oh, Zamfarans, oh, oh, Nigerians, arm yourselves, protect yourselves. And with the proliferation of arms across West Africa, moving to Nigeria, especially in the last six, seven years, we collapsed in Mali, mm -hmm. Libya, you're going to, uh, we're literally 
a war is, on, is, on, is underway, whether we like it or not. It may not be said in, in, as, in as powerful or as profound a term as I've used now, but to, to be fair, to be honest, what you are seeing across board, from across Nigeria, is the decimation of a large number of people that even in a full-fledged war would not happen at this level. All right, but quickly before we go, what do you think that the Zamfara state needs to do? Because sometime this month we um, covered a story of my degree um, people in my degree um, complaining about the fact that rent is getting higher. A lot of people are running to my degree from, you know, where they're having pockets of violence. And I'm guessing even Zamfara State, they're going to have other states who are neighboring states having people come from there just because they're trying to get away from the problems. Mm -hmm. How do we... <laughs> The IG has taken, you know, has said all of these foreigners should leave, you know, the miners, they should all leave the city. But how do you secure those who do not have the means to run away? How do we keep these people safe? Because number one priority of the government uh, and, the, and security agents is to keep and protect lives and property. So w w what is the fate of the average unfair person who doesn't have the means to run away? Well, um, there's, there's a saying I, I heard from, from some of my seniors in, in the military, and they said something, it's a joke, and it goes like this. It says um, there's a, a soldier who was worried about the fact that bullets might be coming his way, and they told him, uh, don't worry about the bullets that are coming your way. If your bullet has your name on it, it's going to get to you. If it doesn't have your name on it, it's not going to get to you. And then the guy asked and said, what about the bullets that are coming with the label to whom it may concern? In other words, I'm in the line of fire. Mm -hmm. So what's going to happen is that you're going to have people who are sitting dogs, unable to run, and the more they begin to flee, this is one of the reasons why Nigeria is treated with, with a lot of um, care and fragility because if anything of that nature happens across Nigeria and it breaks out into a mass exodus of people across West Africa, you're going to see economies feel the pressure of that exodus, of that um, f um, flight for safety, and it can literally cause an economic collapse across West Africa. Well, we're this not hoping for any of that to happen. We'll still t we'll keep uh, Peter uh, in the studio. We'll take a short break. And when we come back, we'll be moving to Kaduna State. And, of course, Rivers is back in the news because some men dressed like security operatives uh, invaded communities and, of course, raided and killed. We'll be right back. It's still Plus Politics. Twenty persons were said to have been killed in a renewed attack by suspected Fulani herdsmen in Ungwan Aku village, Kaduri local government area of Kaduna state. Scores reportedly sustained gunshot injuries. Again, gunmen suspected to be cultists struck in three communities in River State on Monday and reportedly killed 12 persons. Now the question is, what exactly is fueling these senseless killings? I'm still being joined by Peter Egbidion, security expert. <laughs> Peter, I'm sure that you're almost getting sick of these killings, the numbers. They're just, we're reading out these numbers like they're not human beings. Absolutely. They've become just statistics that we read, oh, 12 people died today. And it's, it's, it's causing apathy across the board. Do you, do, you, do, you have a, do you feel a sense that, you know, Nigerians have become somewhat numb to this so we just you know oh some people died in Kaduna oh, oh absolutely ab absolutely in absolutely in fact one of the things on international day of happiness on the 20th of March I sat down with a team of um, experts we had a roundtable discussion and we realized that one of the things that's happened is that Nigerians have developed coping mechanisms for these things so you find a lot of slapstick comedy you find a lot of um, humor um, people People are drinking more now. It's more, there, there's, there are more addictions to hard, hard substances to escape the realities that we're facing on the ground. So because of that, um, we're living, we're, we're living in fool's paradise. If I may use those terms, hmm. it's hard. It's hard. It's hard to escape the truth. So my question, that just as I started in the opening, what do you think is fueling these senseless killings? Because I mean, in Kaduna alone, 20 persons were killed. Pas A source actually said that these 
people dressed like military men invaded the village at about 7 p.m. And I know where I was at 7 p.m. I was on air, and we're still talking about Zamfara. And then we had this. Now, of course, um, the senator representing Kaduna Central um, Senatorial District, Shea Usani, has expressed regrets that just when he wanted to condemn the alleged xenophobic killings yeah, in, of Nigerians in South Africa, um, you, he was devastated by the news, uh, you know, early this morning. So. It seems like everywhere you turn, something is happening. Yesterday I was saying that the cultists in Akwaibum were telling the governor, uh, Udom Emmanuel, that they haven't come to settle us. And they were brandishing guns. Where did they get those guns from? What, what exactly is fueling this? And where is all of this coming from? Like it's, I said earlier on, every single way you turn to, there's some killing or the other. It's a combination of many, of many, of many factors. It's, it's fueled by, by a fight for survival, um, economic, economic relevance and sustenance. Um, it, it is also due to politicization of, of a lot of things. For instance, during the election cycle, we saw that a lot of Thugs, a lot of people were armed to foment violence. We saw um, supposedly some armed men from from Edo State heading to acquire bomb on the supposedly on the orders of a national leader of a prominent party in this country to go and foment trouble in that state, believed to be a stronghold of the PDP. So we've seen that part of what's fueling it is politics. We've also seen that what's fueling it also is greed and, and, and the desperation for power, for survival, a, a grab for resources. If you also look at the conflict that's happening across West Africa and Nigeria, especially in the north, it also has to do with the, uh, the struggle for, for resources. Because we know that in, ad in addition to the to the so-called um, religious angle to the extremism of a group like Boko Haram. For, we also know that the headsmen who are encroaching are also encroaching to be able to get resources to feed their the cattle. Struggle for land. Yeah, struggle mm -hmm. for land as well. So it's a combination of many sources. For, with Zamfara, for instance, we're hearing that um, because of the gold that's been mined illegally as well. Too. So it's, it's, a struggle, it's, it's a combination of many factors that's causing this insecurity. And one of the things that I believe we understate or we don't emphasize enough is the seeming failure of our security architecture to deal with these things. Because if what, what, what does this say about us as a country if everywhere you turn, there is one problem or the other, and they're not tiny pockets of violence, they're issues that could deteriorate, in fact, that have deteriorated so much so that the security agents are saying, we're a bit overwhelmed. It's, it's you know, um, there, there are think tanks that are um, across, across Africa, across the world, and some of these experts will sit down and, and they've arrived at the fact that the fact that Nigeria didn't fulfill prophecies to be a failed state in 2015 or 2014, 2015, doesn't mean that Nigeria is not a failed state yet. It just hasn't collapsed as, as evidently as it, it should have collapsed. Because a lot of things are, are, are just falling apart. If you, if you remember recently, in the last six, seven, eight months, we saw videos of soldiers, members of our armed forces, deserting the army because they were saying that the, 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 the opponent, the, the enemies, Boko Haram, had superior firepower and their, their commanders had left them to the mercy of these people. It, ha it, has, not, it has never been that bad. Um, and when you have things like that happening and the government is hiding its head in the sand like an ostrich, you're only going to give these people more impetus. We saw things happen, for instance, where we, we heard from the mouth of a governor, for instance, that people were paid not to come into Nigeria to kill. Some of these headsmen were paid not to come and kill. What, or even, even ransoms have, have been paid to people who, um, to, to terrorists. What that does is that it empowers them to purchase more ammunition, to foment more trouble. So the way the government has handled it has actually inflamed the tensions and the insecurity. Again, let's, let's, because I, I always, when we talk about government, governments, you know, governments is a progression of sorts, you know, from one administration to the other. Where did we start getting it wrong? Because it seems like we've built, over time, we've learned to sweep issues under the carpet. And now that it has resurfaced, it's more like a hydra-headed monster because, of, I mean, what we're seeing right now. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> What do we do? Where, we go, where do we go from here? Well, um, to, to, to illustrate how bad things have gotten, if a state government or if a gov government can resort to the use of alternative security, such as voodoo and asking snake charmers to, to, and people to pray also, it, it, it tells you that it, it's, it's beyond them. It, it, it's, it's, cold, it's cold word for this thing is bigger than us and we don't know what to do. We're, we're bereft of ideas and... May God help us all. I mean, we have 
I, I'm certain that I'm not wrong, that we have security experts in this country that are trained in Scotland, Yad, they've gone to so, I mean, well, the they, best, they, the best they, they've worked in the with, world. The, you know, with the best in the world. Can we really truly say that, oh, well, you know, we cannot use the intelligence of these people, they, we cannot consult them. I mean, for exa ex example, a state like Kaduna State, a state like Zamfara, they've had issues on and on and on. And, and I'm wondering, in the 21st century, why are we not able to have security consultants? Why do we just rely on police or, or JTF? I mean, I'm not saying that we shouldn't, but why can't we get intel and strategy on how to deal with these issues before they even got to this point? Well, um, again, it's an unwillingness of the administration to embrace people across board. Um, if you remember, a prominent retired general, I, I, um, I'll mention his name, Tewa Danjima, came out to say at a point in time that he believed that government was complicit in some of the things or in the failure of security as we've seen it. So, and he's not he's not he's not a he's not a nobody he's he's quite he's quite a seasoned expert there are many of them across the country across even from those who are now um outside outside nigeria the best minds that have come out from this country they would have loved to contribute but it's believed that there is a a, a, no, a, a no welcome policy of this government. No, there's, not so, there's so much that private consultants can do. Um, we, we heard of a time recently, I believe it was the prior administration of, of Good Luck Jonathan, where we heard that some mercenaries, Blackwater mercenaries, were engaged for certain um, activities within our country. And they were, they were, they were those, those procedures were discontinued when this administration came, came on board. And we've seen that sometimes you will need to adopt certain measures just to get results. If we're not getting the results and we're seeing, for instance, last four years, security architecture, very little, apart from the police, nothing has been done to change people in the, in the armed forces. And when failures are reinforced, as we've seen it, so, I, I mean, it's, it's only going to lead to further collapse of security and, and, so what do we do? Because you see, the reasons, the reason why we have these conversations is because we're looking for solutions to the problem. Yes. What solutions? Where do they start from? For River State is cultism, Akwaibom State is cultism, Cross River is cultism. For some other places, is um, armed robbery and kidnapping, which is also on the rise. Like I said, uh, recently a journalist was kidnapped from in front of his house in the morning as he was mm -hmm. going to read the news, and killed. So. If it's not one thing, it's another. Yes. What do we need to do? Yes, it has gotten bad, but can we at least? We need to the demand issue? more from our leaders. It, it's 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 amazing the kind of things that we've tolerated as part of our threshold for mediocrity and and, and nonsense to be to call it what it is, that in other climes would not even happen. A tenth of it wouldn't happen, and you'd spark up quite a revolution. Um, but here we see that people are afraid to speak up because, so let's look at River State for instance. While people can say on the surface that it's cultism, it's not just cultism because we saw in the last election cycle or in the just concluded election cycle, we saw the militarization of the state. And even if um, people were not going to take up arms, the fact that they were brutalized like that, and then we saw members of the armed forces denying that it was the men who were on ground or who were responsible for those killings. And we saw, we saw the Nigerian army descend to a depth that we've not seen them before. I mean, a cross exchange of, of, of words with politicians. It was dirty. And to, to, for us to get to that point, so what I'm saying is that I believe the number one thing that should be done is that we should hold our leaders to account. With the way we, we've, we've tried with the NSARS movement, but we should, apart from just being on Twitter, it, it, it's, it's, I think it's important. One of the fundamentals of our democracy. We need to occupy need to, once again. Absolutely. It's, it's important. If, if we're losing lives like this, you're losing probably the next Mark Zuckerberg in, in, in Zamfara, or you're losing somebody of equal value who, with, with, a, with, a, with, a, with a solution to, to global problems that we haven't yet seen. And those are valuable lives. Those are valuable lives. Even just, let's even leave the citizens now. Even amongst the armed forces, we see men who have been trained. They've spent lots of money training our security personnel, and they are dying in the war fronts. And it's going to take a lot of money to find other people, because there's not enough recruitment to fill up the ranks quickly. It's really sad. We'll take a short break. We have some reports uh, on the recent happenings. When we come back, uh, I'll be giving you my take.
Well, I want to thank you very much, uh, Peter Ebidian, for thank being you. here in the studio. Uh, a very interesting conversation, but uh, oh. very sad under very sad circumstances. Oh, it's 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 sad, and I hope that somehow amidst the gloom, that we'll, we'll pull out ourselves from this mess that we find ourselves in. All right. Well, here's my take. I'm saddened. And I'm really, really appalled at the fact that we can actually take up arms against one another for gold, for whatever it is, for money, or for superiority. Whatever happened to uh, good neighborliness and brotherhood? Whatever happened to friendship and love and forgiveness? And here we are today, crying over the graves of uh, brothers and sisters, prematurely leaving this earth because of one person, or the other because of hatred, because of greed, because of bad leadership. But the question is, when we're all killing ourselves and destroying Nigeria, what will be left for your children, for the ones that are coming after us? Is this the Nigeria that we want to live for them? Think about it. I am Mariana Cohn and it's been Plus Politics. <laughs>